Take your Bible, 2 Kings chapter number 7. 2 Kings chapter number 7. And while you're turning there, don't know if you heard the story about the bus driver and the pastor who passed away and went to heaven. And uh, as they got to heaven, they were making their way to the pearly gates. The bus driver got there just ahead of the pastor. And so he was walking up and Peter was out there greeting uh, people and welcoming them into heaven. As the bus driver walked up, Peter greeted him by name. And that kind of surprised him a little bit. And then Peter said, now we understand you are a bus driver below. And that shocked him. He said, well, yes, I was. And Peter said, well, thank you for doing that. Peter then informed him that he was in charge of housing. And he said, there's a mansion over there on the hilltop. How does that sound to you? And boy, the bus driver thought, well, this is great. And made his way into the mansion that was given to him. Well, the pastor standing behind the bus driver heard that uh, in exchange and thought, man, if that's what a bus driver gets, I can't wait to see what a pastor is going to get. So a pastor got up to the pearly gates, and there was Peter, and again, greeted him by name and said, now we understand you are a pastor there below. And the pastor said, well, that's right, I was. And Peter said, well, I'm in charge of housing here in heaven, and we've got a shack for you down in the valley. And the pastor looked at him with a saddened face and said, now hang on here a second. I heard you talking to that bus driver, and you gave him a mansion over there on the hilltop, and I was a pastor. I preached the Word of God. I taught people about Jesus and did it faithfully for years. Why am I getting that shack over there in the valley? And Peter looked at him and said, Well, Pastor, when you preached, people slept. But when that bus driver drove his bus, people prayed. Now listen, I know tonight you might be in the comfort of your home and you might be tempted to sleep, but I want to encourage you, stay awake, stay in tune, and I'm trusting that God will use this in my life and in yours together tonight as we look at his word. 2 Kings chapter 7, and if you would look with me beginning in our scripture reading at verse number 3. The Bible says, And there were four leprous men at the entering in of the gate, and they said one to another, Why sit we here until we die? If we say we will enter into the city, then the famine is in the city, and we shall die there. And if we sit still here, we die also. Now therefore come, and let us fall unto the host of the Syrians, if they save us alive, we shall live. And if they kill us, we shall but die. And I want to preach a message tonight entitled, We Have to Do Something. We have to do something. And let us pray. Dearly Father, we love you. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to gather uh, via online, to open your word and to be encouraged and edified. And I pray that you would bless tonight in the preaching of your word. I pray that it would accomplish your work in our hearts and our lives. And may it stir us to action for your honor and your glory. And we'll praise and thank you for this. In Jesus' name, amen. I love to read the Bible. I love to study the Word of God. I love to uh, unfold the stories that we find in Scripture. And this is one of my favorites in all of the Old Testament. The story of these four leprous men. They were outcast. Uh, from their uh, city, they were in a terrible predicament, but God used them in a special way. And tonight I want us to unfold uh, this story and to learn from it some characteristics and some attributes about these men that I believe God desires to see in your life and in mine in this needy hour. And so as we dive into the story tonight, notice from me, first of all, the plight of the lamb. Now this was a very difficult time in the history of God's children. They had been disobedient unto the Lord, and now they are suffering the consequences of it. And we see this as a difficult time, first of all, because Samaria is besieged. Now look back at chapter 6 in 2 Kings, and look at verse number 24. The Bible says, And it came to pass after this, that ben king of Syria, gathered all his hosts, and went up and besieged Samaria. So here we see that Samaria is besieged. Now, at this time in Israel's history, they are divided into a northern and southern kingdom. Jerusalem was the capital of the southern kingdom. Samaria was the capital of the northern kingdom. And here we read in 2 Kings chapter 6 and 7 that Syria, north of Samaria, had sent down their army and they had sieged the city of Samaria. Now, Benhadad was the king of Syria, and he was a very cruel king, a very wicked man. Israel had shown him some mercy before, 
But he betrayed that mercy and that trust and now uh, was attacking the city. The Bible says besieging Samaria. Now siege warfare was a popular type of war a strategy in Bible times here, particularly uh, in this era of the Old Testament. Siege comes from the Latin word and it means to sit. And siege warfare was a opposing army would gather the supplies that they would need. They would go to uh, the enemy city and they would uh, encompass that city uh, and they would have enough supplies to last for many months, sometimes years. And they would let nothing in or out of that city. The goal of that was to starve the people out to the point where they would surrender or that they would be very easily to take in military combat and then to conquer that city and its people. So it's a difficult time in the history of God's children. Their city is under siege from the Syrians. Well, the result of that, we see, is that the land is barren. Look at verse number 25. And there was a great famine in Samaria because of the siege. And behold, they besieged it until an ass's head was sold for fourscore pieces of silver and the fourth part of a cab of dove's dung for five pieces of silver. So there's no food left in the city of Samaria. They're under siege. And as a result of this, the land is barren. They're in a time of great famine. And the people literally are paying a fortune for the meat that they could scrape off the head of a donkey. They are paying a small fortune for any nutrition that they could get from the dung of a dove. It was indeed a very difficult and dark time in their history. This was the uh, inflation of famine and everybody was suffering and starving as a result. By the way, this also depicts sin. Because sin always places an esteemed price on something that is not valuable at all in the eyes of the Lord. And that's exactly what was happening here. They were suffering from famine. They had departed from Jehovah God. They had lived in disobedience and now were suffering the consequences of that. But it gets worse. Look at verse number 26 of 2 Kings chapter 6. The Bible says, And as the king of Israel was passing by upon the wall... There cried a woman unto him, saying, Help me, or help my Lord, O king. And he said, If the Lord do not help thee, when shall I help thee? Out of the barn floor or out of the wine press? The king is saying to the lady, Listen, why are you looking to me for help? If God's not helping us, I don't have anything left as far as food to give. But she goes on in verse uh, 28, And the king said unto her, What aileth thee? And she answereth, This woman said unto me, Give thy son that we may eat him today, and we will eat my son tomorrow. So we boiled my son, and did eat him. And I said unto her on the next day, Give thy son, that we may eat him. And she hath hid her son. And it came to pass, when the king heard the words of the woman, that he rent his clothes, and he passed by upon the wall. And the people looked, and behold, he had sackcloth within upon his flesh. Now here was a very difficult and dark time in the history of God's children. And the king encounters this woman who he then learns that her and another lady conspired and are cannibalizing their own children to survive. And the king is beyond himself. He cannot believe where it has come here in Samaria. And I don't know about you, but there are times as I look out in our country and in our world and I think, how did we get here? Uh, how do we get to the point where uh, we are promoting abortion or homosexuality or we're confusing gender identity or we're seeing the push for communism and Marxism and we're just at every turn it appears that there is some other attack on the principles of the word of God. And Paul spoke of this in 1 Timothy uh, 3.13, but evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Isaiah warned, woe unto them that call evil good and good evil that put darkness for light and light for darkness that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. And there was a reason that they got to this place and that is because they got away from God. And there is a reason why we are in the situation we are in in America today because we too have gotten away from God and we need to get back to God. And that's got to begin with me and with you, with my family and your family, with our church family and other churches all around the country having a passion to be closer to God than they have ever been before. I'm encouraged by the fact that this lady went to the king 
She sought the king for help. And I'm reminded of the fact that we have a king that we can go to as well. The Bible says in Psalms 46, 1, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Boy, this was a difficult time in the history of Israel. They're besieged by Samaria. The land is barren. People are dying of starvation. And then we see that the preacher is blamed. Look at verse 31 of chapter 6. Then he said, Go do so and more also to me. At the head of Elisha, the son of Shaphat, shall stand on him this day. As people are looking to the king with king, how did we get here and we're uh, being besieged by the Syrians and we have no food and people are dying. People are scraping uh, the meat from the head of a donkey or finding nutrition from the dung of a dove or women literally are eating their children. How did we get here? And the king is the a city is looking upon him for an answer said, I'll tell you how we got here and I'll tell you who it is to blame. It's that man. It's the preacher. It's Elisha. Now, Elisha was the prophet of God. Elisha was God's voice, God's messenger, God's representative and ambassador to his children. And it was certainly fortunate for the kingdom that they had Elisha living amongst them and ministering to them and proclaiming the truth of God's word. And this is how God worked here in this time of history. The Bible says, and the Lord spake by his servants, the prophets. And I'm grateful for the fact that we have a human instrument at Lancaster Baptist Church and our pastor. I'm thankful for our pastor's love for the Lord, love for the Bible, love for his family, his ministry philosophy, his integrity of how Lancaster Baptist Church is operated, and we are to pray for our pastor. We are to uh, support our pastor and to follow his faith and his leadership. But the king was doing none of that. In fact, the king was blaming the preacher, Elisha, for the difficulty that was going on. And doesn't that sound familiar to what we often see and hear today? That as things wax worse and worse, as things occur that we thought we may never see in our lifetime, when it comes to the blame game, often it is Christians that are blamed. We are blamed for being too narrow-minded, about as narrow as the book I hold in my hand tonight. We are blamed for being intolerant by the crowd that, of course, is tolerant of anything except anything that has to do with Jesus Christ. And that's exactly what was happening here, is that the blame was being shifted to God's man. And we understand that, listen... If we're going to live righteously and godly in this present world, there's going to be some people who don't like it. There's going to be some critics. There's going to be some mockery. There's going to be some opposition to any Christian who is living a life in pursuit of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we must understand tonight that America is indeed under siege, that we are under attack. We're not going to stop the attack, but we have to do something. And so we see the plight of the land. It was not a good situation. But notice really, secondly tonight, the persistence of the lepers. Now, I just love uh, the men and the women who God chooses to use in the Bible. And this is such a wonderful story. One commentator said, God often chooses what to us would seem the most unlikely instruments so that the work may be seen of Him and the glory all of His. And God oftentimes will choose to do something very special in Scripture through a very unlikely instrument so that when the work is accomplished, it is obvious that is something that God did and it is all to His honor and to His glory. And that is exactly what we see here in the persistency of the lepers. Now there would be no one more unlikely to do anything about this situation a city under siege, people dying of starvation, uh, a, a, an entire city about to be wiped out, great despair and darkness everywhere, as people would be looking for a remedy, for a savior, for someone to bring something good about. Nobody would be thinking, oh yeah, we have those leprous guys outside the city. Let's ask them. Nobody thought that in Samaria, but that indeed was God's plan. So let's study these leprous men. I want us first of all to look at their resume. Look at verse 3 of chapter 7. Back to our text if you would. The Bible says, And there were four leprous men at the entering in of the gate. Now, how adequate were these men to uh, do something about the terrible situation that they find themselves and their city in at this moment? The Bible says that these were leprous men. 
uh, because of their leprosy, they were excluded from society. Because of their leprosy, they were not welcome in the city. Because of their leprosy, they were dependent upon friends and family to bring them food, to even survive. Because of their leprosy, they had been declared ceremonially unclean. We learn of this in Leviticus, where the Bible says in chapter 13, verse 3, And the priest shall look on the plague and the skin of the flesh. And when the hair and the plague is turned white, and the plague and the sight be deeper than the skin of his flesh, it is the plague of leprosy. And the priest shall look on him and pronounce him unclean. It goes on to say, And all the days wherein the plague shall be in him, he shall be defiled. He is unclean. He shall dwell alone. Without the camp shall his habitation be. So if you contracted leprosy in the Old Testament era, you were determined to be unclean by the priest, and then you were cast out of the camp. You were cast out of the city. You were cast out of society. You were to live in the outskirts alone. You were to be away from people. And if you came in contact with anyone around you, you talk about social distancing, when you came in contact with anyone around you, you were to yell at them, unclean! unclean so that they would know that you have leprosy and so that they could stay as far away from you as was possible to not contract the deadly and terrible disease that you possessed in your body well as we study leprosy in the bible we see it as a type of sin and it reminds you and i tonight that before we came to jesus christ we were in a predicament equally as desperate we were like these lepers and we were sitting among the dead and having no hope and without God in this world. But I don't know about you, I'm so thankful for the day that Jesus Christ came into my life and I identify with Psalm 40 that I waited patiently for the Lord and He inclined unto me and He heard my cry. He brought me us also out of a horrible pit and out of a miry clay and set my feet upon a rock and established my goings. He hath put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. Many shall see it in fear and shall trust in the Lord. Boy, I'm grateful that Jesus Christ came to me when I was in the predicament of sin. And I hope tonight that you're grateful for God's goodness and love and the fact that He came to you. But we see these men and the situation in which they're living kind of makes us think that, boy, Whatever excuse I might have in my mind of God not being able to use me or me not being qualified enough or having a, a, a resume uh, uh, impressive enough that God could use. Friend, when we think about these men, we don't have an excuse for why God could not use you or me. But I want us to see then the rationale. Continue in verse 3 of chapter 7. And they said one to another, Why sit we here until we die? If we say we will enter into the city, then the famine is in the city, and we shall die there. And if we sit still here, we die also. Now therefore come, and let us fall into the host of the Syrians. If they save us alive, we shall live, and if they kill us, we shall but die. Now, here these lepers faced a dismal situation. Death stared them in the face at every turn. They had one of three options. They could stay where they were, on the outskirts of Samaria. Uh, dependent upon friends and family to bring them food, except nobody had food to bring. And so they were going to die. Or they could go into Samaria, and they could try to get food there. The problem was there was no food in Samaria. People were scraping the uh, meat off of the head of a donkey, or buying dung, or literally eating their children. And so there was no reason to go into the city. There was no food left. But they could go out to the Syrian army. And yes, they might be killed going into enemy camp, or the enemy might have mercy on them and give them some food, give them some scraps or leftovers. And that was the only option that there may be food for them to eat. And so that is the option that they take. And I love as we read their rationale, as we read their discussion, as we read their process of, can we go here, go there, whatever, because it demonstrates to us a spirit and an attitude of action that they were not going to just give up. They weren't going to just sit outside the city and say, you know, it's really a bad time. Uh, people in the city are dying and literally turning to cannibalism to survive. And the enemy is right outside in siege of the city. And we're just on the brink of, of failure and destruction and defeat. 
And here we are, we have leprosy, and we're dying of starvation. And so let's just sit here and die. No, that wasn't their spirit. It didn't look good on any front. It was difficulty all around them. But inside of them, they were determined they're not just going to sit there and die. They're going to get up and they're going to do something. And I believe that they possessed an attitude and a spirit that you and I so desperately need tonight as God's children. You and I as followers of Jesus Christ, believers in Jesus Christ, we must possess a spirit and an attitude that we can't just sit around and watch everything that's happening around us and daily through the news feeds and the headlines and the stories and seeing the decay and the destruction all around us and just kind of have a spirit of, well, Lord, come quickly. Yes, I pray that He does come quickly, but I pray when He comes, He finds me occupying till He comes. He finds me doing something till He comes. He finds me uh, busy in the work and the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. They had an attitude that you and I so desperately need. They had a spirit that we need. And we're reminded tonight that our attitude determines our altitude. And sometimes the question is posed, well, why is it that some followers of Christ are not doing something for the Lord? Why is it that some are not in service of the King? Why is it that some are not doing more? Well, for some, it's inability. They've come to a place in their life where they don't believe they can do anything. They don't have anything to offer. I love the story of Joshua Chamberlain. Joshua Chamberlain was an English teacher. He's actually an English uh, college professor in the state of Maine. And the Civil War uh, broke out here in America. And Joshua Chamberlain was enlisted into the Union Army. And he became the uh, colonel of the 20th a regiment of Maine and was given leadership of a thousand men and as he served in the Union Army they were given various assignments and and uh, tasks and he led his men valiantly they uh, warred courageously and and had many victories and on one particular day Colonel Joshua Chamberlain was given a very important mission he and the men of the 20th uh, regiment of Maine were given the mission of defending the southern slope of the little round top. Now this was very important because it was the extreme left of the Union Army line that ran all the way down to a little town called Gettysburg. And Colonel Joshua Chamberlain was told that you and your men must hold the little uh, round top of the Union arm, uh, Union line, uh, the, the extreme left of the Union line at all costs. Uh, no matter what, you must hold that line uh, during the Battle of Gettysburg. So Colonel Joshua Chamberlain got his men together and they began to tell them of their mission, that they had been given the extreme left of the Union Army line, that they were to hold it at all costs, that they were to defend the southern slope of the little round top. And so the men at Colonel Joshua Chamberlain's direction began to gather rock that they found in the field and they began to build a a wall out of these stones and the wall came about thigh high and it was about a football field in length and then Colonel Joshua Chamberlain again had a thousand men when he started at this particular time and battle was down down to about 300 men and he told those men to get behind that wall and to get their gun and their ammunition and prepare at all costs to hold the line well they made all the preparations and then the battle of Gettysburg was set in array and the Confederate soldiers would make advancements and Colonel Joshua Chamberlain and those men would defend that extreme left of the Union Army line they would defend the southern slope of the little round top and after advance and after advance they would defend and push back and defend and push back after one such successful defense of that line Colonel Joshua Chamberlain gathered his men together as the Confederate troops retreated back the men looked at Colonel Joshua Chamberlain about 50 percent had suffered through casualty they were down to about 150 men and they looked at Colonel Joshua Chamberlain and they said Colonel we're out of guns and we're out of ammunition what are your orders Colonel Joshua Chamberlain looked at those men, two of them being his own brothers, and he said, I want you to get the ammunition and the weaponry from the wounded, the dead and the wounded. And they said, Colonel Joshua Chamberlain, we've already done that. You told us that last time. We don't have any more ammunition. What are your orders? And while they're having this conversation, there was a boy up in a tree, just a teenager, and he was looking out over uh, at scouting it to the Confederate troops and what they were doing. And he began to yell down to Colonel Joshua Chamberlain, Colonel, they're coming. 
Colonel, they've got reinforcements and they're coming. And the men were looking at Colonel Joshua Chamberlain and they said, Sir, what are your orders? And Colonel Joshua Chamberlain looked at those men in the face and he said, Fix bayonets. Fix bayonets. And I don't know about you, those men had to be thinking, what are we going to do with little knives come out of our guns against these guys that have got bullets? But sure enough, up and down that stone wall, you could hear the sound of metal on metal as those men fixed bayonets. And Colonel Joshua Chamberlain said, you fix bayonets, you get down behind that wall and you watch me and you follow my lead. And Colonel Joshua Chamberlain fixed his own bayonet. He got down behind that stone wall. He was looking at that little boy up in the tree. That boy was giving him the scattering report of where the Confederate troops were. And just when they were in the right spot, Colonel Joshua Chamberlain jumped over that wall and he yelled, charge! And all those men with him that day did the same thing. And that day, just a few men captured hundreds of Confederate soldiers. That day, the 20th Regiment of Maine successfully defended the southern slope of the Little Round Top. They held the extreme left of the Union Army line. And as a consequence, the Union Army won the Battle of Gettysburg. Now, historians tell us that had the Confederate soldiers broken that line, that they most assuredly would have won the Battle of Gettysburg. They believe that if the Confederate Army would have won the Battle of Gettysburg, that they subsequently would have won the Civil War. Some believe that had the Confederate Army won the Civil War, that America today would be much more like Europe, comprised of 9 to 13 individual countries instead of one United States of America. If that be true, there would not have been the one world power to stand up to the wickedness of World War I and World War II. You say, Gabe, where are you going with all of this? Here's what I'm saying. There was an English teacher in the state of Maine who did what he could with what he had and it made a difference in my life today. Now friend, God can use you to make a difference. But you must be convinced that God can use you to make a difference. And that God can use your life to make a difference in the life of someone else. And we must not allow Satan to convince us that, well, there's nothing we can do anyway. Friend, we can do something because of the God that we serve. Some suffer from inability. Well, I just don't know what I could do. Well, God looked at Moses and said, Moses, what do you have in your hand? He said, uh, uh, Lord, I just have a rod. And how about the lad? He just had uh, five loaves and two fishes. And how about David? What is that? It's just a sling and some stones. And uh, Gideon, what do you have? Well, we're just down to 300 men. But they all had God. And that was all they needed. But for some, it's not inability. It's indifference. It's literally getting to a place where they don't even care. There's great destruction and distress. There's great decay. There's great unrest. There's great need. But somehow, some way, they have uh, kind of galvanized their own conscience and they just have gotten to a place where they don't even care. Can I challenge all of us tonight to see people as Jesus saw them? The Bible says that He looked on them and He had compassion upon them. He loved them. He yearned that they might know Him. That they might have a relationship with Him. That they might be a follower of His. If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear their prayers and I will turn from heaven. I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. Friend, may you and I have the spirit and the attitude of these leprous men that we must indeed do something. The plight of the land, it was terrible. The persistence of the lepers, it was awesome. But notice as we close tonight, the provision of the Lord. God shows up. And whenever you and I act in faith, God always responds. Isaiah says, Yea, before the day was, I am He, and there is none that can deliver out of my hand. I will work, and who shall let it? Are you and I willing to let the Lord work through us tonight to make a difference in our area for the cause of Christ and to the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, the Lord indeed provided for these men. And we see, first of all, that it was a surprise to them. Look at verse number 5. And they rose up. And the twilight to go into the camp of the Syrians. And when they were come to the uttermost part of the camp of Syria, behold, there was no man there. For the Lord had made the host of the Syrians to hear a noise of chariots 
and the noise of horses, even the noise of a great host. And they said one to another, Lo, the king of Israel hath hired against us the kings of the Hittites and the kings of the Egyptians to come upon us. Wherefore they arose and fled in the twilight and left their tents and their horses and their asses, even the camp as it was, and fled for their life. So here are these four leprous men. They're outside the city of Samaria. Death uh, encounters them on every turn. And they say, we're going to go into enemy camp. We're hoping they're going to have mercy on us and we can just get some food. Man, people will do anything when they're really hungry. So they're heading into the enemy camp of Syria. It's twilight. It's dusk. Uh, the sun's gone down. It's not pitch black, but it's, it's dark. And they're making their way from outside that city wall and they're making their way over to uh, the Syrian army camp that's uh, besieging the city of Samaria. And as they get to the outer part of the camp, again, it's, it's about dark, it's about nighttime, so many men would be in their tents and uh, maybe eating or resting or whatever, but no doubt they uh, were sure to encounter a guard, uh, uh, someone on the lookout or whatever, but as they're making their way into the outskirts of that camp, there's, there's nobody. As they get closer to the tent, there's nobody. There's, there's no noise of people. There's no noise of conversation. It, it, they're just kind of in shock. What's going on? And so they make their way all the way to the edge of the camp. And now they can see tents and, and they don't see anybody at all. So they go into the first tent and they go into the first tent and there's dinner that had been prepared. There's, there's a, a raiment. There's gold and silver. There's everything as it was, the Bible says, but there's no people and as they went around the camp indeed there was not a, 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 a Syrian soldier anywhere in sight because God had driven them out and I love how the Lord did it he just took a noise and uh, he sent that noise to the enemy camp and they thought man there's an army of the Hittites and the Egyptians coming and so they took off leaving everything behind some 25 miles they fled over to the Jordan River and left the camp as it was and to the surprise of these leprous men nobody is there now by the way you say again how did that happen it was a miracle God did it and by the way God is still in the miracle working business tonight and I'm thankful for that so to the surprise of these men there's no one in the camp and look at what happens in verse 8 and when these lepers came to the uttermost part of the camp they went into one tent and did eat and drank and carried then silver and gold and raiment, and went and hid it, and came again, and entered into another tent, and carried thence also, and went and hid it. Now we see that they are savoring the goodness of the Lord. Uh, here was the Lord's provision, and it was being savored by these men. These were men that were outcast. They were unclean. Uh, they were left to die. They had lived off the scraps coming off the tables of family members and friends, and yet now they are in these tents that are completely deserted by the Syrian army, and there is food in abundance, and so they are eating that food, and oh, how good it must have tasted to finally have food and abundance of food, and so they're picking out on that food, and maybe one tent was Italian, and maybe one tent was Chinese, I don't know, but man, they were enjoying the food, and they were enjoying the splendor, and they were enjoying the provision of the Lord, and then there was raiment there. Boy, these men were in tattered clothes, and they, they were not cared for by anyone, and now there was new robes for them to wear. But then there was gold and there was silver. The Bible says that they gathered that and they began to hide it. I mean, they were living the big life. They were savoring the goodness of the Lord. Hasn't God been good to us tonight? I know it's easy to look around and to listen to outside voices and then to focus on the things that we don't have or that we don't like or that are not going our way. But friend, can I remind you, we've got a lot to be thankful for tonight. Uh, I'm grateful that we have a God who loves us. I'm thankful that we have a son who died on the cross that we might have eternal life. I'm thankful that uh, I walked into this church tonight uh, on my own two feet that I can walk. I'm thankful I've got hands that work. I've got eyes that see and ears that can hear and a mind that can reason most of the time. I'm thankful I live in America. I still believe America is the greatest country on the planet. I'm grateful for my wife. We celebrated 19 years of marriage this summer. I'm thankful for our four wonderful children. I'm thankful for our church and our pastor. I'm thankful for you. We've got a lot to be thankful for. God indeed has been good. And if we're not careful, we'll listen to the talking points of this world and we will find ourselves every day focusing on that which we don't have or that which we don't like. And I just want to encourage you to rise above that and to see the goodness and the provision of the Lord. These men uh, were savoring God's 
goodness. But something happens. As we close, look at verse number 9. The Bible says, Then they said one to another, We do not well. This day is a day of good tidings, and we hold our peace. If we tarry till the morning light, some mischief will come upon us. Now therefore come, that we may go and tell the king's household. So they came, and they called unto the porter of the city, and they told them, saying, We came into the camp of the Syrians, and behold, there was no man there, neither voice of man, but horses tied and asses tied in the tents as they were. And he called the porters, and they told it to the king's house within. These four leprous men, bellies full, stuffed to the gills, new raiment on their shoulders, gold and silver hidden in earth for their uh, prosperity. And yet in the midst of all of the goodness of the Lord, they said, we do not well. This is a day of good tidings. God has been so good to us. God has provided for us. God has answered our prayer. God has taken care of us. We have got to tell somebody else. And can I encourage you tonight at lbclive.tv for wherever you're listening. May you and I have a spirit this week. We have got to tell somebody else. May we take the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I know we're not seeing maybe as many people as we would see before COVID. But it might be a co-worker. It might be a neighbor. It might be somebody in a grocery store. It might be somebody at a gas station. It might be somebody in line for a cup of coffee. I don't know where, but can I encourage you this week? Can you and I be determined? Every single person that we cross paths with, we're going to share with them the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to invite them to our 8 o'clock outdoor service. We're going to invite them to join with us online. We're going to invite them to read the verses that tell them about the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to tell them the difference that Jesus Christ made in our life and how we desire that they may know Christ as well. You see, these leprous men could not just savor the provision of the Lord. They had to share it. And may you and I be convinced that we must share it as well, that we may preach the gospel to every creature. Paul said, For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of. For necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is it unto me if I preach not the gospel. Friend, woe it is unto us if we preach not the gospel. The church is like these four leprous men. We have the good news of salvation, but we must not keep it to ourselves. Uh, we could talk all day long about everything that is wrong in this world. <laughs> we could exchange dialogue for many, many hours about the problems of our day. But let's do something about it. Let's take the love of the Lord Jesus Christ and let's share it. Let's punch a hole in this darkness with the light of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ and let's make a difference for the cause of Christ. And I love in this story how they say in verse number 9 that they could not even tarry till the morning light. They got together and they said, boy, God's been good. Man, we've got a belly full of food. We haven't had that in a long time. we got new clothes. This is pretty good. Man, we've got gold and silver for a lifetime. This is awesome. But they said, there's people in that city and they're literally scraping the meat off the head of a donkey. They're literally eating the dung of a dove. They're literally eating their own children. We've got to take this to them. We've got to let them know what God has done. And then they said as they talked, and we can't wait till tomorrow morning. Tomorrow morning that city is going to wake up. And they're going to look out here and they're going to see that the camp is empty. That there's not an enemy in sight. And they're going to see that there's food available, raiment available, and gold and silver available. And if they find out that we knew about it and we didn't tell them, they're going to be mad at us. The Bible says they were fearful that some mischief should fall upon them. They said, we can't even wait till tomorrow morning. We've got to go tell them right now. And friend, can I remind you tonight that now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. We can't wait. That co-worker, that neighbor, that person that God has put on your heart, it can't wait. We've got to go to them. We've got to go to them with some urgency with the gospel of Jesus Christ. We can't wait till the morning light where some mischief should come upon us. We can't wait till somebody faces eternity and not knowing Jesus Christ as their Savior. We may get one shot, so we've got to take advantage of every shot and sharing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. They said, we do not well. We cannot hold our peace in this desperate hour. You say, yeah, but Gabe, we live in a difficult area. This is Southern California in Los Angeles County. Yeah, I know, they did too. Mothers were literally eating their children. Yeah, but Gabe, I don't have a lot to offer. 
I don't sing. I don't speak. Well, these were just four men with leprosy. But I'll tell you what these men had. Faith in God. And can I encourage you tonight to renew your faith in God? The God that spoke the world into being. The God who split the Red Sea and brought His children across on dry ground. The God who knocked down the walls of Jericho. The God who sent fire down from heaven and consumed the sacrifice. Who gave sight to the blind and healed the lame. Who spoke to the wind and the sea. And who on the third day rose again for my victory and for your victory. May you and I tonight renew our faith in our God. Pandemic. COVID, whatever may be going on, God is able to save. So tonight, can I ask you, do you know Jesus Christ is your personal Lord and Savior? If you were to die tonight, are you certain that you would spend an eternity in heaven? And friend, if you don't know, can I encourage you tonight to place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ? For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but of everlasting life. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. For by grace he is saved through faith in that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh unto the Father but by me. Tonight, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, would you trust him, believe in him, and receive him as your Savior? Ask him to pay for your sins and to take in heaven someday. And then tonight, if you're watching and you know Christ, you're His Father. You've placed your faith and trust in Him already. Then can I encourage you this week, tell somebody. Do something with it. God's given you the wonderful gift of a personal relationship with Him. Savor it. Thank God for His goodness. But go beyond that and share it. Let somebody else be blessed because you share with them the life-changing story of the gospel of Jesus Christ. May we take the challenge of these leprous men and do something with what God has given to us. Dear Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you, Lord, tonight for some time in your word. And I pray, Lord, that we would conclude our time reminded that there's been difficult days all throughout the history of humanity. May we be reminded of the attitude and the spirit that we need to possess as a follower of Christ to do something. And may we be reminded of the goodness, greatness, and amazing work of our God. Lord, help us tonight to renew our faith in you, to see you for who you are. Those tuning in tonight who don't know you, I pray that they would place their faith and trust in you, that they would let us know that they've made that decision so that we can reach out to them and follow up. And then for every believer tuning in tonight, I pray that we would receive the challenge of these four leprous men. We've got to do something. Yes, God's been good to us, but we can't just savor it. We've got to share it. So help us this week to get out of our comfort zone, to go to that neighbor, to go to that coworker, to go to that person that you've brought into our life, and to tell them about you their need of a Savior, and the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray that you would use our church in our area to make a difference this week for your honor and for your glory. And for this, we promise to praise and to thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.